Thank you all for joining us for our six Howard Mathematica panel discussion. I'm proud to introduce one of our six Howard Mathematica alums who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Nanette. My name is Amber Mackey, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania and a six Howard Mathematica 2022 alum. And I'm honored to introduce our panelist, Keith E. Sonderling, JD. Keith E. Sonderling was confirmed by the U.S. Senate with a bipartisan vote to be a commissioner on the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, in 2020. Until January of 2021, he served as the commission's vice chair. His term expires July of 2024. Prior to his confirmation to the EEOC, Commissioner Sonderling served as the acting and deputy administrator of the Wage and Hour Division at the U.S. Department of Labor. Before joining the Department of Labor in 2017, Commissioner Sonderling practiced labor and employment law in Florida. Commissioner Sonderling also serves as a professional lecturer in the law at the George Washington University Law School, teaching employment discrimination. Since joining the EEOC, one of the commissioner's highest priorities is ensuring that artificial intelligence and workplace technologies are designed and deployed consistent with longstanding civil rights law. Commissioner Sonderling has published numerous articles on the benefits and potential harms of using artificial intelligence-based technology in the workplace, and he speaks globally on these emerging issues. Welcome, Commissioner Sonderling. The floor is yours. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to present to you today and then to be able to discuss with you further in depth this topic during our Q&A this summer. So I want to first start out a little bit about what my agency does here. So the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is the federal agency responsible for enforcing laws that make it illegal to discriminate in the workplace. So we administer and enforce the big ticket employment laws like Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, the Equal Pay Act, the AIDS Discrimination in Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. These laws protect not only employees, but applicants from discrimination based upon a person's race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, pregnancy, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information. The laws apply to all types of work situations, hiring, firing, promotions, trainings, wages, benefits, and prevents harassment and retaliation. So when you think about some of the employment issues in the news, such as the Me Too movement, pay equity, that's really our agency here. There's a lot of agencies that deal with labor and employment, especially in Washington, DC. Um, but now you have a better understanding of what we specifically do here at the EEOC. So what I wanna talk about today, relevant to um, this uh, conference and this conversation is about artificial intelligence. And, and you just heard, we have a lot on our plate here um, with all employment discrimination in the United States whether you're discriminated by a private employer, state or local government, or even the federal government, or the agency responsible for dealing with those issues. So how does that relate to artificial intelligence? Well, as we know, as being discussed, you know, AI is really rapidly taking over in businesses, in governments. Um, and a lot of the programs being developed in artificial intelligence outside of our specific area haven't really dealt with a very fundamental issue. And that issue is how are these technologies going to be designed and deployed with long standing civil rights laws in mind? So, you know, a lot of people, when you first start thinking about artificial intelligence in the workplace, your mind sort of wanders to this dystopian future of robot armies replacing human workers. And there's a lot of statistics out there that will discuss that. The World Economic Forum predicts in the next four years, 85 million jobs may be displaced by AI. A 2019 Brookings Institute study that examined the overlap between the text of AI patents and the text of job descriptions from the Department of Labor database found that of the 769 job categories included by Department of Labor, 740 of them had some near-term risk of automation. We've already seen artificial intelligence allegedly outperform doctors, lawyers, and journalists. And by 2025, AI will be so pervasive that machines and humans will be working the same amount of hours. You know, PwC also released a study 
predicting that 38% of all U.S. jobs might be automated by new tools such as artificial intelligence, and it might be cheap to do so. Research has shown that robotic process automation, businesses are building robots that cost around $10,000 a year to displace two to four human workers. And companies are buying more robots in the workplace as the labor shortages continue to linger. So most conversations about AI in the workplace are about the future. But I'm not going to talk about that today. Today, I'm going to talk about the present because the present from standpoint, when you're talking about AI and workplace anti-discrimination law, the future is already happening. You know, I want to first start, and I know a lot of you know this, with the, what are we talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence? And there's a lot of different definitions out there. Conference board put out a pretty easy to understand one of what AI actually is. And it's a technology that mimics human thinking by making assumptions, learning, reasoning, problem solving, or predicting with a high degree of autonomy. So I know you all know generally what it is. I just thought that was a very easy to understand definition as we talk to different people about AI. When it comes to human resources though, today HR departments have more information about individual workers than ever before. But as you all know, information is not the same as knowledge. The information needs to be read and assimilated in order for it to be understood. That's where AI comes in. It takes dizzying amounts of data legible for businesses by calling and correlating information on a massive scale to make workforce related predictions. And that's turning into huge business. HR tech spending tripled to nearly $17 billion in 2021. And some people think in the next five years, that will be around $30 billion. But this turn to AI driven HR technologies did not happen overnight. The reason I'm talking about it and the reason the EEOC is looking at the AI is that AI has already been involved in the decision-making stage at, for years in the entire job life cycle. So AI writes job descriptions, screens resumes, chats with applicants, conducts job interviews, and then predicts if an employee will accept an offer, and in some cases predicts how the employee will interact with their new coworkers. It identifies employees' current skills and potential skills, tracks productivity, assesses workers, and picks who gets those valuable and career-changing upskilling and reskilling opportunities. Nowadays, if employees fall short of expectations, an AI algorithm may even send them a message saying, you're fired. This isn't my forward-looking prediction about the future. For each and every one of the tasks I just mentioned, you could find a commercially available product ready for purchase right now. The pandemic has increased the speed of these developments as employers and employees find an increasing dependence on the connections that can be made through artificial intelligence. In short, AI is making all types of decisions once made by HR personnel. This is not necessarily a bad thing, nor is it necessarily a good thing. At the risk of sounding like a lawyer, it really all depends. Carefully designed and properly used though, I believe that AI has the potential to advance diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in the workforce by mitigating the risk of unlawful discrimination. You know, a lot of you potentially have heard about the numerous studies that have shown the ways employment decisions are vulnerable to bias on the part of hiring professionals. You know, that's part of the reason the EEOC exists. For example, one study showed that hiring managers are more likely to favor resumes featuring male names over female names, even though the resumes were otherwise identical. Another study showed that African Americans and Asian Americans who whiten their resume what do I mean by that? By deleting the references to their race, receive more callbacks than identical applicants that included racial references. But oftentimes HR professionals do not care, become aware of the discriminatory conduct until it is too late. But AI can help eliminate bias from the earliest stages of the hiring process. For example, an AI enabled resume screening program can be taught to disregard variables that have nothing to do with the performance of that person's ability to do the job such as an applicant's name. An applicant's name may signal correctly or incorrectly variables that usually have nothing to do with the applicant's qualifications, such as the applicant's sex, national origin, religion, or race. Likewise, an AI-enabled program that conducts preliminary screening interviews can be engineered to disregard factors such as age, sex, race, disability, and pregnancy. It can even disregard variables that might merely suggest a candidate's membership in a protected class such as foreign or regional accents and speech impairments. And in some cases, replacing an interviewer with a bot eliminates the opportunity for intentional discrimination at the screening phase of the hiring process. So it's not unheard of for an interviewer to meet a highly qualified candidate 
who is visibly pregnant, disabled, or religiously observant and think to themselves, this person is going to cost me. Accommodations will cost me. Healthcare will cost me. Leave will cost me. This candidate just isn't worth it. So I will go with someone else with similar skills who won't make these requests. This obviously very highly illegal example is one of many instances of bias that AI might mitigate. But at the same time, poorly designed and carelessly implemented, AI can discriminate on a scale and magnitude far greater than any individual HR professional. Like any bad HR decision, poor uses of artificial intelligence will damage trust in the organization that uses it, create a toxic work culture, and ultimately damage the profitability, all while increasing the risk of litigation. That's because artificial intelligence is only as good as its purposeful and insightful application by informed organizations with an eye on actual impact and compliance with the law. In our case, purposeful application of artificial intelligence means consideration of everything from the quality of the data being used to the continuous monitoring of an algorithm after it has been deployed. That's because the AI predictions it makes are only as good as the training data on which the algorithms relied. For example, an algorithm that relies solely on the characteristics of a company's current workforce to model the attributes of the ideal job applicant may unintentionally replicate the status quo. If the current workforce is made up primarily of employees of one race, one gender, or one age group, the algorithm may automatically screen out applicants who do not share those same characteristics. Case in point, employing this metric, a resume screening company found that the most likely predictors of success at one particular firm were being named Jared and having played high school lacrosse. As an attorney, I've dedicated my career to labor and employment law. I want to see AI reach its full potential in the workplace. As an EEOC commissioner, I'm committed to helping workers and employers understand their rights and obligations when it comes to these technologies. There are countless new technologies on the markets to help employers make employment decisions more efficiently, economically, and effectively. Many of them promise to advance diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace by mitigating bias. So given the current state of the market, deciding whether to adopt HR technologies is not a hard choice. But deciding which to adopt and for what purpose may be the very hard choice indeed. So you've heard about the EEOC's mission. But many of the laws we enforce predate by over half a century the AI technologies I'm discussing. Nevertheless, federal anti-discrimination law is as applicable to employers who use AI to make employment decisions as they are to employers who rely exclusively on HR professionals. Because all these employment decisions that AI are making are laws, apply to all of them. So I wanted to just take a moment now, and without giving you a full law school lesson on labor and employment law, it's under important to understand the two theories of discrimination we enforce here. And to keep it simple, think intentional discrimination or unintentional discrimination. So intentional discrimination is called disparate treatment, and it's when an employer deliberately treats some people less favorably than others because of their membership in a protected class, for example, their race, sex, or religion. So for the simplest example of disparate treatment, if an employer were just to throw away resumes of all applicants of one race, that employer would be engaging in disparate treatment discrimination. Disparate impact discrimination exists when an employment practice that is neutral on its face has an adverse employment impact on a protected class. Here's an example. Let's say a company wants to increase the likelihood that its employees will arrive to work on time every day. So it decides to simply hire people who live in the zip code next to the office. That's the only qualification to work at this company. If those zip codes are populated predominantly by members of one race, the policy may then have the effect of excluding members of other races from job opportunities, even though the intent of the policy was to make sure that no one is late for work. While this pertreatment claim requires a showing of discriminatory intent, disparate impact does not. Employers are equally liable whether or not they intended to discriminate. And this is an absolutely crucial thing to bear in mind as companies start going all in on HR technologies. In HR, data is everything. Data makes the, the, the difference between a good hire and a bad hire, a good promotion and a bad promotion. And what I'm trying to raise awareness of, it's the difference between lawful and unlawful decisions. So, you know, when you think about somebody who's just throwing a resume in the trash because they don't like the person, you know, that may or may not be illegal. But if they're throwing the resume in the trash because let's say the person is older, let's say the person is of a certain national origin, it's very hard for us and others to understand why they would do that. But AI can correct for that black box problem. 
carefully designed. AI can mask for race, gender, age, disability, and other characteristics. It can mask for proxy terms, like the example I told you earlier, people's names, the names of sports teams, or someone's graduation date. It can help employers take a skills-based approach to hiring. It can help offset the well-documented confidence gap that leads women to underreport their abilities on resumes and men to overstate theirs. It can identify candidates' adjacent skills, and it can identify candidates for those upskilling opportunity, all while judging people on their potential and stripping out human bias. But at the same time, it can replicate and amplify existing bias when it's poorly designed. So now that you understand the basic requirements, let's discuss how this has actually worked. So, you know, there, there's a um, reports about an AI driven resume screening tool tested by uh, Amazon between 2015 and 2017. Um, this is a widely discussed use case, you know, whether or not this actually happened. It's more stories of legends at this point, but it really helps people understand. So in that case, programmers fed a data set consisting of resumes belonging to Amazon's current employees, along with resumes that had been submitted to the firm in the prior 10 years. Using machine learning, the program was able to identify patterns in the historic data set and then use those patterns to rate new applicants on a scale from one to five based on their resumes. However, because the vast majority of resumes in the data set belonged to men, the program began automatically downgrading resumes with certain word combinations, such as women's sports team, women's clubs, and the names of women's colleges. This was not proof of misogynistic intent on the part of the AI. It was a function of the data fed to the AI in the first place. So when it comes to AI, legal scholars, software engineers, and vendors tend to focus on disparate impact discrimination like this. However, claims of discrimination by AI can and easily do fall under the umbrella of disparate treatment, that intentional liability. So this was the example here is not an EEOC case. This was a public class action case um, that alleged that Facebook's advertising practices, including use of its AI algorithms, violated state anti-discrimination law. So there in court filings, the plaintiff alleged that a number of companies restricted their employment ads to certain age groups in violation of age discrimination laws. The lawsuit alleged that employers could create a tailor-made applicant pool by simply ticking off boxes on a list of characteristics. They could include an include box next to preferred characteristics or an exclude box next to disfavored characteristics. Shortly after the complaint was filed, Facebook announced that it would be disabling a number of advertising features until the company could conduct a full review of how exclusion targeting was being used. And as part of the settlement, Facebook pledged to establish a separate advertising portal with limited targeting options for employment ads. Allowing employers to exclude people from their applicant pool in the manner alleged in this case goes even further than pre-civil rights job advertisements directly telling people not to apply. So in those cases, it withholds the very existence of job opportunities from members of a protected class on the very basis of their membership in a protected class, solely on their protected class. And what do I mean by that? They were unable to exercise their civil rights because they never saw the job opportunity only because they were in that category that people allegedly were preventing them from applying, seeing the job opportunity. After all, you can't sue from exclusion for a job opportunity if you do not know that opportunity existed in the first place. So in an instance like this, with just a few clicks, employers can engage in disparate treatment on a scale far greater than ever before. Outside the realm of science fiction, AI has no motives or intentions of its own. AI only has algorithms that enable it to correlate data and make predictions. And according to industry experts, this is one of the things that makes AI attractive to employers. AI's reliance on hard data creates a potential to eliminate individuals' discrimination by removing human bias from the decision-making. And when AI is designed in a clear and explainable way, it eliminates one of the biggest challenges to effective human resources management, human taste. At the same time, the apparently objective nature of algorithmic decision-making can result in technological bias on the part of the user that is over reliance, if not bind trust, that the robots will always get it right. In this case, the user may lose sight of the fact that AI is self-reinforcing and requires close monitoring. So employers can't adopt a set and forget it approach to HR technologies because inaccurate, incomplete, or unrepresentative data will only amplify rather than minimize bias in decision-making. So the example I gave you before about Amazon's alleged resume screening program is an example of how biased inputs can yield biased outputs. 
but is also an example of how a vigilant employer didn't simply trust the algorithms to get things right. They tested the program, evaluated its performance, and when it proved unworkable, they abandoned the program without ever actually using it to make a hiring decision. But as I mentioned earlier, AI is not just being used to hire, it's being used at every stage of the employment decision-making, beginning with the very decision to start recruiting. At the pre-hiring stage, AI has the potential to make recruiting more inclusive. For example, using natural language processing, it's helped employers write job descriptions that promote greater diversity in their applicant pools. The way a job description is written, specific words used, and the way requirements are described can have a significant influence on who applies. So there's now AI programs that go out there and compare linguistic patterns and job descriptions with historical applicant behavior and correlating hiring outcomes to predict which word combinations are more likely to attract applicants. In fact, programs can claim it can predict which word combinations are more likely to attract applicants based on gender. It provides real-time feedback to employers on how likely their word choices risk alienating applicants of one gender or another, enabling the employer to aim for maximum inclusivity. AI also promises to reduce talent acquisition to a science, helping employers identify and target highly qualified candidates who may not even be looking for a job. In this case, marketing firms and headhunters are replaced by publicly available data that scrape data from the internet, social media, resume databases, and then find who may be the best for that job. You know, online advertisement platforms do this all the time in the commercial context. That's why when you click on something on the internet, it follows you everywhere you go. But micro-targeting ads to an audience is one thing when you're trying to sell a product. It is quite another when you're advertising federally protected employment opportunities. For example, if the algorithm's training data skews heavily towards people of one race, sex, religion, or national origin, these protected characteristics may come to play an improper role in the algorithm's predictions about the member's target audience. It may, like some of the examples I mentioned earlier, downgrade proxies for race or gender, such as the names of historically black colleges or the names of women's sports teams. And again, not because the computer is intentionally targeting and discriminating against these people. It's because they simply were not represented in the training data. The program is compounded by the fact that as with Facebook's audience exclusions, Individuals may never know they were denied the equal opportunity in the workplace because they were never told a workplace opportunity existed. But some vendors are offering data-driven solutions to what in essence are data-driven problems. They train their algorithms primarily on candidates' job skills and personal capacities. They filter out proxies for memberships and protected classes such as race, sex, national origin, or disability. They aim to build more inclusive training inputs while also validating for bias in outputs. These bias mitigation strategies can be as effective at the hiring stage as at the recruiting stage. The use of AI in hiring doesn't stop with resume screening programs. It is also being used to conduct job interviews. Here, a bot presents a series of questions that the applicant answers on video. Then, natural language processing comes into play, evaluating the substance of candidates' interview. A reliance on voice alone may reduce, reduce the risk of discrimination based on outward appearance. But without sufficient safeguards, voice recognition may be unable to account for foreign accents or speech impairments, giving rise to the potential for disparate impact based upon national origin and disability. But even if these biases could be controlled for, it may not be enough. Some interview programs also incorporate facial recognition and facial analysis technology. These facial analysis technology purportedly identify a subject's facial expressions to make predictions about the candidate's personality and capacity for success in a particular role. Whether facial ana analysis can actually predict how good a plumber or a neurosurgeon candidate will be based upon the number of times they fur their brow is beyond the EEOC's jurisdiction. However, whether facial analysis has a disparate impact on people is squarely within the EEOC's jurisdiction. Facial expressions are not universal. They vary across cultures and contexts, and for that matter, may be limited by disability. Accordingly, a facial analysis algorithm may automatically downgrade a disproportionate number of candidates who belong to a protected class simply because they were underrepresented in the computer's original training data. This all assumes that the computer can even recognize the applicant. Serious concerns about racial discrimination arise if an interview bot cannot even identify the face it's analyzing because the candidate has dark skin. When researchers at MIT's Gender Shades Project texted, tested the dominant commercial gender classification algorithms, the findings were startling. Algorithms achieved an accuracy rate of over 99% in identifying light-skinned males. 
Now compare that 99% accuracy rate for identifying dark-skinned females, which ranges between 65 to 79%. The researchers attributed this disparity to the underrepresentation of dark-skinned women in the training data on which the algorithm relied. However, the tension between whether hiring technologies actually deliver on their promises and whether they effectively discriminate is also evident in the case of employee assessments. Assessments became commonplace in the years following World War II as the field of organizational psychology grew and as the post-war period ushered in an economic boom. Multiple choice assessments that were once completed with a number of two pencils on Scantron sheets now look more like video games than the SAT. These assessments are proving highly valuable in high yield, high turnover employers. And they have the potential to minimize bias in hiring by shifting the employer's focus from a resume to aptitudes and attributes. But at the same time, they are as vulnerable to disparate impact claims of Scantron sheets as old, so employers must use them with equal diligence. After all, the Supreme Court decision that created this impact analysis, Griggs versus Duke Power, turned on a dispersion and adverse effect the companies had on African-American employees. Additionally, online assessments present a novel challenge to people with disabilities because of the generalized electronic interface they employ. Under the ADA, employers must engage in an individualized interactive process to provide a reasonable accommodations to people with disabilities. By design, the ADA does not allow for a one-size-fits-all approach to employment opportunities. The ADA requires reasonable accommodations appropriate to the individual's needs. This is particularly important to remember now that companies are relying on AI to perform managerial functions. AI presents a challenge for finding the right division between algorithms and HR personnel, between using AI to improve human decision and delegating decisions entirely to an algorithm. Using AI decisions ordinarily made by HR professionals can have significant legal ramifications, so employees should exercise caution when deciding whether and how to use algorithms and when to turn them over. There may be cases in which compliance with federal anti-discrimination laws requires human intervention. This is frequently the case when it comes to workplace accommodations for pregnant, disabled, or religious employees. Generally, these accommodations occur through a process called the interactive process between employer and employee, two humans. Most of the time, an employee initiates the interactive process by notifying the employer of the need for reasonable accommodation, a conversation that can be sensitive and personnel and even difficult for employees to have. If employee's primary interface with his employer is an app, that process may be daunting to initiate and it may not even be clear who their point of contact is. In fact, it may come as a surprise that there are instances in which employer may be expected to initiate the interactive process without being asked. For example, if the employer knows that the employee has experienced workplace problems because of disability. Under those circumstances, the process often starts when a supervisor senses with their own eyes or judgment that an employee is struggling. An algorithm, no matter how sophisticated, may not be capable of the sort of sensitivity and responsiveness needed to meet the needs of employees in need of accommodation. This means that humans must remain in the decision-making loop. So whether employers rely on algorithms or HR, they must develop and implement policies to handle requests for these accommodations. So now that you've heard about the overview issue, I wanna tell you what we're doing here in the government about this. So in October of 2021, the EEOC formally announced an initiative to use of AI in the workplace. The initiative will examine more closely how technology is fundamentally challenging the way employment decisions are made. It aims to guide applicants, employees, employers, and technologies, vendors in ensuring that these technologies are used fairly, consistent with federal equal employment opportunity laws. As part of the new initiative, the EEOC plans to establish an internal working group to coordinate the agency's work on the initiative, launch a series of listening sessions with key stakeholders, gather information about the adoption, design, and impact of hiring, and identify promising practices and issuing technical assistance. In May, we released a technical assistance document titled the Americans with Disability Act and use of software algorithms, artificial intelligence to assess job applications. The document focuses on preventing discrimination against job seekers and employees with disabilities. It provides practical tips to employers on how to comply with the ADA, as well as tips for job applicants and employees who believe that their rights may have been violated. The guidance highlights three common ways the AI decision could violate the Americans with Disability Act. If the employer does not provide reasonable accommodations, if the employer relies on the AI to make tools that intentionally or unintentionally screens out an individual with disabilities, 
or if the employer adopts AI tools for which the job applicants or employees are required then to give specific disability which are not proper sometimes under the law. So all this to say is that employers should do their due diligence when it comes to vetting AI. Workplace discrimination imposes heavy human, social, and financial costs. So I know I've covered a lot of ground and I'm very excited to have an interactive discussion with you and hear your questions. So I will conclude with some key takeaways from today. First, our laws might be old, but they're not outdated. They apply with equal strength to employment decisions made with AI in 2023 and beyond as they did to decisions made by HR personnel in the 1960s. Second, whatever the algorithm is, whatever the decisions, employers must both watch for discriminatory uses and discriminatory outcomes because liability will be the same either way. Deciding to entrust algorithms with people's livelihood is a complex and important matter. We cannot fully realize the potential of AI unless it's developed and utilized in a manner consistent with our laws and values. So while AI is becoming mainstream technology in the workplace, discrimination by algorithm must not. I want to thank you again for having me today. Uh, it's been an honor to be able to present, and I'm very excited for our discussion. Thank you for joining us. I know our participants are looking forward to live Q&A with you during your Institute panel this summer. Thank you all for watching. For more information on SIX Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.